Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 5.30 to 6 o'clock session of the 2021 Open Simulator Community Conference. In this session, we are pleased to introduce the presentation, Designing Educational Virtual Simulations. Our speakers are Dr. Rachel Umoran and Matt Cook. Rachel is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Washington, where she is the director of neonatal education and simulation-based training and neonatal telemedicine lead. She is also an adjunct professor in the University of Washington's Department of Global Health. Matt is a design engineer for the University of Washington and a Unity virtual reality developer. Matt's experience includes designing and developing VR for education and research applications. Please check the website found at conference.opensimilar.org for speaker bios, for details of the session, and the full schedule of events. The session is being live streamed and recorded, so if you have questions or comments during the session, you may send tweets to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag Pound OSCC 21. Welcome, everyone. Let's begin the session. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here once again. I think this has been the best conference yet, and I've been attending this conference since 2013. So today we're pleased to be here to discuss designing educational virtual simulations for learners of diverse professions and cultures. And I've been working, like many of us, in the metaverse for about 10 years now. And my focus has really been on the use of virtual simulations for training health professional learners. So it's truly exciting to be here. I've learned so much from the wonderful presentations so far. And I really welcome any questions or comments from the audience, particularly educators who have been working in this space. So we've used Second Life and OpenSim as well as Unity platforms, and we continue to explore how to most effectively teach and evaluate learners in both high and low resource settings using virtual simulations. And our work is really platform agnostic at this point. You know, we're just looking for the best fit for our learners. So I'd like to just give a quick shout out to Stephen. I saw him in the audience earlier from the Vibe group because they really got us started um, with that transition from Second Life to OpenSim and, and beyond. So much appreciated. Um, so these experiences have really led me to reflect on the importance of design principles and concepts, which we'll be sharing with you. And several years ago, I started thinking about how learners in different platforms and with different professions responded to the virtual simulations that we were putting them through. Um, some of these thoughts were really brought on by a study that we undertook with learners in three different professional programs. Uh, they were in nursing, occupational therapy, and the physician physician assistant programs in Indiana University. Um, we had a total of 319 learners who participated in a study on the impact of teamwork training. And we used the same virtual simulation for all the groups. Um, we, you know, at that point in time, you know, we were working with a collaborative, um, some of uh, the members uh, you probably already no, and actually one of whom this talk is in, um, in memoriam of, uh, Barbara Truman. And so we looked at the change in their teamwork attitudes. And, and while for the most part, you know, it was interesting to see that there were significant changes in all teamwork domains and there were small changes. But when we looked at the groups by profession, we found that the baseline and the post-training attitudes really differed significantly by their profession. So this gave us some pause and it, it certainly seemed like it was not a one-size-fit-all uh, for sure, but 
you know, we started to think about it. So the baseline attitudes could potentially be explained by the fact that, you know, the nurses and the occupational therapists may have been you know, socialized towards more supportive behavior and work in teams, whereas the you know, physician assistant students maybe tended to work more on their own or with a particular physician. But it, it didn't fully explain the differences in outcomes for learners with the same baseline. So on this next slide, um, you'll see that you know, there were learners that started out pretty much in the same spot, but then had a more dramatic increase in their performance uh, having encountered the same simulation. So professional identity uh, has been you know, really conceptualized as the knowledge of challenges and opportunities that are typical within a profession, as well as the individual choices that an in a person might make in their decision making and their behavior. And when we think about the scenario based interprofessional simulations, what they do is they provide learners with an effective method to really explore the roles and the responsibilities of their profession as well as others. However, we need to be careful about thinking about you know, how we conceptualize these training scenarios. And this comes in with the design process. So the scenarios have that potential to create, but they also have the potential to reinforce certain professional identity and stereotypes and influence professional collaboration, either in a productive or in a restrictive way. But it's not just about professional identity. In virtual simulations on public and global health that we created here in Open Simulator, but we've explored the impact of environment in health and you know, social and environmental factors, you know, also play a role in the design of simulations for use by learners in settings, particularly those with limited resources. So as we know, the learning outcome depends greatly on the design of the experience. And you know, Matt and I are working together on a new project funded by the National Institutes of Health to develop mobile virtual simulations that will train healthcare workers on how to provide essential newborn care in low resource settings. So while we were just getting started on that work, we thought we'd share some of our early lessons learned. And we'll be brief, as I know we're the only thing standing between you and the after party. <laughs> But I, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Matt. Hi. So I'm going to talk to you very briefly um, about some of the high level uh, considerations to be thinking about when designing educational virtual simulations. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. So. The, mo the first thing you need to do is bring your team together. And it's important that you have a wide variety of skill sets in on this team. So one of the most important is, of course, your technical team. So that would include your programmers, your world builders, your, uh, your artists, all the people that need to actually build the thing. Um, but those builders don't necessarily kind of know what to do, they though they need there needs to be some direction involved, and for that you need to be, you need to have those ma managerial people involved too. So people like uh, the designers, uh, producers, whatever um, synonym you have for that general role that knows how to bring it all together and knows how to how to develop and design and make something good, but. Even if you have all those, those you know the technical or the managerial, the designing people, uh, people, they don't necessarily know what to make. So it, for whatever educational application you're trying to build, you need to know your material backwards and forth, uh, backwards and forwards. Otherwise, you'll never be able to design anything. And that's where you need your subject matter experts. You need to be working closely with them throughout the entirety of your design process. Um, or if you don't have access to that, it takes research, 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 research to it's a long drawn out process to actually to know your material well enough to to 
properly design and teach for it. So next slide. So as once you have your team together, as soon as you possibly can, you need to define your goals and objectives for the project. Now I want to draw a distinction between the goals of the pro goals of the application versus the learning objectives to be completed within the application. So like Rachel said, uh, we are uh, creating a v virtual um, learning tool to teach essential newborn care in low resource settings. So the goals of the project would be in that case would could include um, making the material more accessible to a, a wider variety of people or um, making the material immersive to include to improve the quality of the learning. But the learning objectives, uh, among other things, could include uh, how to resuscitate a baby or how to recognize the different danger signs. Uh, and when it comes to the learning objectives, it's also important that you be as specific as you possibly can. So saying you'll you need to teach the learners need to learn how to resuscitate a baby. Well, that's one thing that's good. Uh, what's better is if you can say, OK, the the learning objective is to for the learner to know to hold the uh, cup, the baby's head in a, this very specific way and keep a tight seal with your fingers all over the baby's face to make sure air doesn't leak. Um, so that level of specificity, that's how you properly know what it is you need to be developing because if you don't have those objectives defined your game is I promise you from experience doing this poorly your game your application is going to be a mess if you can't define these so next slide know your audience I have been involved in projects where people just want to write it off as yeah the the uh experience is the simulation is for anyone. We'll just teach anyone who's interested in learning and though that's our audience. No, your audience is not anyone. You have to worry about um, you know age, age groups and how you are going to um, talk to them. Um, you, you need to know what it is they know, what the, what knowledge they're lacking, what you know what their base knowledge is, where, where to build from, um, any uh, physical characteristics, you know, uh, are they hard of movement, hard of hearing, anything, anything like that? Just the more you can, the more you can know and define your learners, the easier it'll be to make your design decisions. Next slide. Now, obviously, you're going to need to be able to teach your material, but it's also important to cons uh, think about how you're going to assess the material um, because it's important to include that in that assessment portion to make sure that you're actually teaching the the uh, material properly and make sure that your learners have a, effectively learned it so it's uh what that assessment can will look like will vary from your by your application um, but it's uh, important to take to um, take steps throughout your experience to kind of allow the user to evaluate how they're doing. Next slide. Um, yeah, allowing the user to evaluate how they're doing comes dives into the feedback. It's important that you provide feedback throughout the experience. Um, so that the user knows, you know, knows that they're on the right track or not, and can evaluate how how much they are actually understanding, making sure they're understanding properly versus how they think they're doing. Uh, so this can be rather tricky to accomplish. Um, it's a a great deal of research to be done here, but it's in, uh, yeah, it, it's important to be doing. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, next slide. 
So when you when you're designing a virtual simulation, you have a number of different medium options. Um, this could be mobile based, computer based. Um, even within a computer, you have uh, could have a standalone application. It could be uh, in a medium such as OpenSim or um, each of these different mediums has their pros and their cons. Uh, in turn. So it's really important that you n understand the limitations and possibilities for your meet for your medium and make sure they align properly with your learning objectives and the goals of your project. Um, with these media with these mediums, they have a tendency to look like video games, um, both in terms of their appearance, but also their functionality. The mechanics tend to be aligned. Now this can be tricky for, for particularly for video game novices because not only are they having to learn the material but they don't have the same level of experience with the medium so they're having to learn that at, at the same time so i come from a game background i've developed video games i grew up playing video games i know i know that how how all this works so when i'm designing i'm Oh, every single time I'm, I design something new, I'm surprised by what people get confused by. I always try my best to make decisions that will be obvious and intuitive to novices, but in some way or another, I always tend to be in, wrong about one thing or another. So it just goes to show you have to be really mindful and careful about how you design your experiences. And then on for the, do include these novices and then the gamers they they're, they're going i assure you they're at some they're going to look at your experience and they're going to want to think of it like a video game and and if depending on what you're trying to do maybe you're trying to gamify your learning maybe you want to but many times it's not a video game and so they're going to kind of tear it apart uh complaining but um yeah just keep that in mind um uh, next slide <laughs> So ultimately, what you need is a design product. So that could look like a that could be a flowchart, it could be a storyboard, or any number of things. But really, what's what you need, what what's important, is to be able to describe and visualize exactly what your game is going to look like and how it's going to work, or or that game, your application is going uh, in as extreme a detail as you possibly can. If you can't do that, then you've still got decisions to make and you don't have a complete design. Oh, next slide. Yeah. Questions? Thank you. Are there any questions from our audience? haven't seen any come in, but there's been some wonderful conversation about your thoughts, and Rachel's been answering or exchanging information. If there are no questions, Rachel, did you have any final thoughts before we wrap? Well, thank you all for being here and for listening. I just included um, on my last slide this acknowledgement of the impact that our dear friend Barbara Truman had on my thinking around this area and transdisciplinarity and you know how learners you know can be designed for as well as you know how we can work together in groups to design for learners of different professions so that's a wonderful sentiment and that this is our last presentation to just give another call out to the wonderful work in her memory thank you rachel and thank you matt for such a great presentation as a reminder to our audience, we want you to check out the conference.opensimulator.org to see what is coming up on the conference schedule. Following this session at 6.05 p.m., we will celebrate another successful conference at the Dream Pop Rave at Pirates Atoll on the DigiWorlds grid and dance to the music of DJ Stranick. 
Also, we encourage you to visit the OSCC 21 Poster Expo in the OSCC Expo 3 region to find accompanying information on presentations and to explore the Hypergrid Tour resources in OSCC Expo 2 region, along with our sponsor and our crowdfunder booths located throughout all of the OSCC Expo regions. Thank you again to our speakers and to you, the audience. Thank you.